Uh, my name is Butch Briner. I'm part of the development staff. And on behalf of Father Paul and the rest of the staff, allow me to welcome you back to St. Vincent. Uh, there's nothing we like better than the chance to have our alumni and our students together. I'd like to again welcome the Manoli family. Thank you for being part of this event and uh, continuing it through the years. And uh, I will turn things over to introduce our guest of honor. I'm gonna turn things over to representing the Manoli um, Lecture Committee, Father Brian Boozel of Class of 96. Thank you, Butch, and welcome, everyone. Tonight's gathering is the first time that many of us who knew and loved Anita Levin Manoli have been able to get together in the same place to reflect upon this dear soul who passed into God's loving embrace this past June. Tonight, we honor Anita the loving and devoted wife, partner, and other half of Chuck for 65 years. Anita was a loving mother to Anne, CJ, Joan, Gerard, and Hugh, and grandmother to eight, and great-grandmother to five. But Anita was also a second mother to hundreds of students, both those whom she taught and those whom Chuck taught. Anita was wise and, indepe and independent, a consummate conversationalist, a philanthropist, and an intellectual who, like Chuck, was always curious what one was reading, and at the present moment would inquire of that person what they were reading, wanting book titles and authors available at a moment's notice. Anita loved her alma mater, Seton Hill University, and loved her second home, St. Vincent College. At this point, I can see Anita waving at me and saying, oh, Brian, enough about me. Please do sit down. <laughs> Anita gave the best off-the-cuff pep talks. She worked for the betterment of people and tirelessly promoted equality. Anita is known throughout Western Pennsylvania for her service to the fine arts, but I believe her greatest contribution is that she was truly interested in people, in their success, in supporting them, no matter what they're calling in life. We celebrate that Anita and Chuck are united in paradise, and we believe that they also are with us this evening and are proud of each one of us and love each one of us. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Chuck. We love you. Tonight, it is also my privilege to join everyone present as we welcome home attorney Kimberly Colonna to her alma mater, St. Vincent College. Attorney Colonna and I went to school together at St. Vincent in a magical time called the mid-1990s. <laughs> Kim was a few years ahead of my class, but was part of a group of St. Vincent women who were the campus leaders, who were intelligent, studied hard, who served as role models for us freshmen and our big sisters, and most importantly, taught us how to find balance, that key Benedictine trait in our lives and in our studies, how to kick back once in a while and have fun. The class of 1994 took us the class of 96, under their wings and taught us how to work hard at school, to build lasting friendships, to enjoy the time we had at St. Vincent along the way. Many of us, myself included, looked up to Kim, that young lady from Selensburg, PA, who came from a loving family who supported her desire to study at St. Vincent College. 
Mom and Dad Kelowna, Ruth and Jim of happy memory, were known to us all as Kim was not the only of the Kelowna children to study at St. Vincent. And her dad, Jim, was also a proud alumnus. And her aunt, Jeanette, was also my music teacher at Butler High. <laughs> <clears throat> Upon graduation, Kim began her study of law at and graduated with a Juris Doctorate in 1997. Today, Kim has over 20 years' experience in education law. She works with universities and schools, with educators and administrators, and most importantly, with and for students. Her dedication to education rights and student rights under the law has garnered her notice and laud as she was named a Pennsylvania super lawyer Pennsylvania 40 under 40, select lawyers, and St. Vincent College alumna of distinction, just to name a few. Kim is a sought-after lecturer and speaker and has published in the field of education law. Closer to home, Kim serves her alma mater, St. Vincent College, as vice chairperson of the board of directors. Kim is a consummate professional, a scholar, a humanitarian. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce a attorney Kimberly Colonna as the 2022 lecture speaker of the Manoli Lecture Series. Welcome home, Kim. <clears throat> just a bit. <clears throat> um, I love it when you people who still are here on campus say welcome home to me. It makes me choke up just a little bit. Um, thank you, Father Brian, for that most incredible and beautiful introduction. <clears throat> Father Paul, members of the Minoli family, students, colleagues, friends, mentors, I am honored to have the opportunity to speak to all of you tonight and to be with you at this event benefiting the Charles and Anita Minoli Scholarship Fund. I could not have been more delighted when Mike Walsh and Anne reached out to me and asked me to play just this small part in the Minoli Scholarship Fund's work to honor Chuck and Anita's legacy and to support scholarships at St. Vincent College. Scholarships were an important part of me getting through my four years here. And I'm just so pleased to think about how this night will contribute in a small way to that amazing scholarship fund that's having a real impact. I have to confess at the outset, however, that I never had Professor Minoli for class. Many of my classmates did. And I'm not really sure what confluence events resulted in my missing the opportunity to have a class with him, but I do specifically recall him as an ever-present and vibrant part of this campus. I have just the most distinct memory of him and his glasses talking to students in Alfred, in the cafeteria, in the shack. Um, he was definitely one of those warm and engaged, I think of them as the statesmen of St. Vincent College. My journey from St. Vincent as an English major with an education minor led me to law school and then an internship with the Pennsylvania Department of Education's legal office. And I have to just pause, I'm trying not to go off script by the way, but I'm gonna go off script and just say that while I was there, one of my mentors was James Sheehan, another bear cat. And over drinks sometime, I will tell you a great story about the, the amazing favor that Jim Sheehan did for me when I woke up one day to drive to my internship and found my car on fire. <laughs> so from there, I went to work for the federal court in Rhode Island and then eventually came back to Pennsylvania where I joined my current law firm in Harrisburg. Within the first 48 hours on the job, I was invited to be the second attorney in the firm's higher education group, 
there was one, now there were two. A group that provided legal counsel to, college and to colleges and universities, and, and I've been doing that for almost 20, about 23 years now. I often say that colleges and universities are the best clients, and, and I don't say that in front of my colleagues because I don't want them stealing away my clients and my work. They have deep dedication to their important educational missions. They are wonderful communities. A huge part of that community is young and vibrant and driven students. They have the most interesting legal issues. That doesn't mean, however, that their legal issues are easy. In fact, they are not. Many of my ever-growing number of gray hairs can be attributed to the difficult legal issues that my college and university clients have faced and that we worked through together. And some of the most challenging and nuanced issues that I deal with involve student civil rights. It is because those issues are often the most challenging and the most nuanced that I want to talk to you about them tonight. But, but please don't run for the door. I believe that as members of the St. Vincent community, we are uniquely qualified to engage with these challenging issues and to really enjoy doing it. And that's not only because so many of you faculty, administrators, students are part of a campus community where these issues have real impacts on you and on the institution, but it's also because of the hallmarks of a benediction, Benedictine education that gives us all a great roadmap to talking about challenging issues in a respectful and accepting way. So my goal for tonight is to delve a bit more deeply into some of the nuances of civil rights laws that impact campuses today, and to talk a little bit about how those laws have developed over time, and to leave you all, I hope, encouraged about our ability to engage in civil discourse about those issues, to be leaders in doing so, and to do that no matter how difficult the issues are and how many gray hairs they may give you. I do want to say that because I'll be talking about Title IX and other discrimination laws, um, I, I want to acknowledge that this presentation will reference sexual harassment, sexual violence, and discrimination based on sex, race, and disability, just in case that's a concern to anyone in the room. <clears throat> All right, so should we get started? So, Let's do a little level set. <clears throat> we probably all know that civil rights are rights of personal liberty and equality that are enforced by law. The right to vote, the right to a fair trial, the right to non-discrimination. And when I talk about student civil rights, I mean those same rights of personal liberty and equality that students have as participants in a higher education institution. Key among those is the right to be free from discrimination based upon a legally protected trait, such as race, religion, sex, or disability. And when I say that there are challenging and nuanced issues um, that are raised in this area, I don't mean <laughs> that there is any question that students enjoy those legal protections or even that they should enjoy those legal protections. They do. The law provides that. The difficulties arise in how those legal protections are applied in real life scenarios where the law is changing over time and where sometimes one person's rights conflict, maybe at an intersection or maybe head on, but conflict with the rights of another person. One of the areas of student civil rights that has gotten the most attention over the last decade is Title IX. And we read about Title IX issues in the press often and usually in the context of some form of sexual misconduct that occurred on campus. And with all, and I mean this sincerely, with all due respect to the important job of the press, more often than not, the coverage of Title IX doesn't begin to scratch the surface of the complexities of that law. When I read those newspaper articles, it makes me want to tear out my gray hairs because I think they just can't get below the surface. All right, so Title IX is a federal law that prohibits discrimination based on audience participation, gender, or sex. Uh, the initial focus of Title IX was what? Sports. Excellent. 
Title IX was enacted in 1972. It was 50 years ago. I know that because I was born in 1972. <laughs> Anyone know how long Title IX is, the statute? 37 words. That's it. These are those words. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That's all 37 words. I want to talk to you just a little bit, and I'm going to go off script again and apologize because, as I said to Professor Kelly at dinner, I love what I do, and I think it's really interesting. But I have also seen the looks on my family's faces at Thanksgiving when somebody makes the mistake of asking me if I have any interesting cases right now. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to try to do this quickly. But I, I wanted to, because I find it just so interesting, and, I, and it is relevant, I wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of a road map of how we got from 37 words in 1972 focused on sports equality to, to where we are now which is much different, right, what you read in the newspaper about Title IX. Um, in 1980, the National Advisory Council on Women's Educational Programs said that Title IX should be construed to explicitly prohibit sexual harassment, especially of students by faculty. That was really the first public pronouncement that said, hey, you know what, Title IX is broader than sports. In 1981, the United States Department of Education Office of Civil Rights, and I'm sure you've read about them in the press, right? They're the enforcement agency for Title IX. They said, they agree, sexual harassment constitutes differential treatment on the basis of sex, and therefore is a violation of Title IX. And, they, and, then, and then they defined sexual harassment, <clears throat> that office. They said it's verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature imposed on the basis of sex by an employee or agent of the institution that denies, limits, provides different, um, or conditions the provision of aid, benefits, or services that are protected under Title IX, right? So we've gone from sports equity to harassment by employees, faculty, agents. And then interestingly, oh, I, I should have told you this before, right after Title IX was enacted, I think it was June of 72, a whole bunch of complaints were filed with the United States Department of Education. By uh, five years later, there were over 100. And they were all, as, as far as I have researched and read, they were all about sports equity. <clears throat> After these statements were made, several lawsuits were filed alleging sexual harassment under Title IX. But they met with essentially no success. None of those cases were successful. The courts would not accept the idea that Title IX covered sexual harassment. They said, no, Title IX is about equal access. It's not about harassment. So how do we get to where we are today? Well, in the early 90s, in the years when I was a student here on campus, um, there, were a few, there was a confluence of some events. <clears throat> Justice Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearing occurred, right? And for those of you who are a, a little bit younger than me, or a lot younger than me, um, there, were, there were allegations made that, that he had sexually harassed his employee, Anita Hill. Um, there was an event called Tail Hook. You guys remember Tail Hook, right? An allegation that uh, in the course of an, an Air, For a Air Force events that there was uh, predominant sexual harassment of, of women in the Air Force. Those two events really led to a national debate on sexual harassment, the likes of which had never been seen before and which hadn't yet been seen again until recent years with the Me Too movement. <clears throat> After that kind of national conversation, lawsuits under Title IX asserting sexual harassment, they began to be successful. And then in 1999, and I was in law school at this time, a key case was decided by the Supreme Court. Are you guys like dying of boredom? <laughs> you can't say yes. 
A key case was decided by the United States Supreme Court. It's called Davis versus Monroe. It's still one of the most important Title IX cases that's, that's out there, so 20 something years later. And in that case, the United States Supreme Court ruled this way, that schools may be liable for damages under Title IX for student to student sexual harassment. Right, so this was the next big step forward in Title IX and how it broadened sports equity, harassment by school officials or agents, to now, hey, schools, hey, higher education institutions, primarily, all those, anyone who receives federal funds and who runs an educational program, you guys are responsible for making sure that students don't harass one another. You're responsible for the environment that your students experience on your campus. And so in that case, the court recognized what we call, and you've probably read about, hostile environment sexual harassment. And, you know, we often hear about these cases by name. You hear a name dropped here, Brown versus Board, you know, Doe, obviously. I always like to figure out, like, what was the case really about, just so that people know. Like, what's, again, I IRL, right? I think this is a thing that I'm supposed to know from my younger nieces and nephews in real life. Right? IRL, what was, what was Davis about? Davis was actually about a public school situation involving a fifth grade student. That student was harassed by a classmate. The classmate made sexual comp comments, attempted sexual touching, engaged in sort of mimicking of sexual behaviors, and the conduct occurred over a, a five month period. Multiple teachers and principal, and the principal of the school were informed, and, and again, I, I wasn't there, but this is what the case says, um, that they were informed, but according to the case decision, there was very little response. And that's what led the courts to say, wait a minute, Title IX needs to be broader. It needs to look at that environment kind of question too. So that was the first clear precedent, national precedent, that Title IX includes an obligation to address the hostile environment. <clears throat> and when we think about that, we're usually talking about multiple institutions or one very significant institution where, an inst where, where there was a failure to protect a person who experienced some kind of sexual misconduct, harassment, sexual violence, et cetera, that was caused by another student, not, not just the institution's employee. So then the next big thing that happened, and I was a practicing lawyer at this time, was 2011, the thing called the Dear Colleague Letter, right? You've heard about that too. Issued by the, the, the Office of Civil Rights. And it required schools to investigate and address complaints of sexual misconduct if they knew about them, okay, that's a no-brainer, or if they reasonably should know about them. Okay, maybe that's not such a no-brainer. It required institutions to use a preponderance of evidence standard in disciplinary processes involving sexual misconduct complaints. This 2011 Dear Colleague letter raised a, a vast number of very controversial issues. So in 2011, I'm at my firm about 11 years and I have these college and university clients, and they're saying to me things like, what <laughs> does reasonably should know mean? I don't have an answer for that question because the legal landscape <laughs> is shifting. It's much different from 1972, 1980, 1990, right? It, it's a shifting landscape, and we're all, we're all trying to figure it out together. I should tell you that one of my other goals for tonight's speech is to not indicate to you Kim Colonna's personal opinions about any student civil rights issues, Ex except these opinions. These issues are really important, they're really challenging, and they're very much nuanced. Beyond that, what Kim Colonna thinks about any of these issues really isn't relevant to any of you, <laughs> and to the broader conversation that I wanna to talk to you about tonight. <clears throat> so I'm gonna just talk to you about the kinds of controversies and questions that have been raised. So what does reasonably should know? What facts tell us that an institution reasonably should know? What if multiple students know that one student was harassed by another? Does that mean the institution reasonably should know? Does that mean that the administration knows and the administration has a legal duty to act? 
What if multiple students testify that the incident was well known around campus, that everybody knew, that there was a rumor? Does the institution reasonably know at that point that there's an incident that it's obligated to address? What if multiple students and one employee knows of the incident? What if that employee is a student who's employed in the copy center? Reasonably should know. What if that employee is an RA in the dormitory? Reasonably should know. <laughs> what if five student employees know? What if five professors know? What if them all know, but none of them know the names of the students who were involved? What are the institution's legal obligations then? What if there's an anonymous post on the institution's social media about an incident? Now we all agree, and the law tells us, that if the institution reasonably know, it has to take action. But what action does it have to take? If you have a, if you have a student who experienced something and you don't even know their name, or you have a student who experienced something and they have come forward and asked for support, but they won't tell you who it is that they accuse inflicted the experience on them. Do you compel your students to disclose if their friend has come to them about an experience of sexual harassment or sexual misconduct? Do you compel your students? Do you compel your employees? Do you compel your college counselors? Do you compel your student advisors? What, what actions need to be taken? What if an allegation is made against a group of students, say a sports team or a club or even a class, the senior class, the sophomore class? What do you do in that case? Do you interview every sophomore? Do you interview every member on the team? What if they don't want to share information? Do you compel them? The, these are the in real life kind of scenarios that make these issues really difficult to talk about and really difficult to deal with. And, and as I promised you at the beginning, I promise to leave you with, I think, what will be encouraging thoughts about how to deal with this struggle that we have. One of the other things that the 2011 Dear Colleague letter said is that institutions cannot stop their investigations while a police investigation is ongoing. So if you have a situation where the college knows that student X has been accused of a certain thing and the police are also investigating student X for that same certain thing, the Dear Colleague letter in 2011 said you can't stop your proceedings. Stopping the proceedings while criminal investigations go on creates too long a delay. That's what the government told us. Not stopping puts everyone through two investigations. A student who may have experienced a very traumatic incident of sexual violence is now having to experience two investigations. Is that, is that an okay outcome because of the requirement to keep going even while the police are doing their own work. A student who's accused may be advised not to participate in a college's proceedings due to the impact that that participation might have on their criminal case. And not participating may result in that student being found responsible when they might otherwise not be. And they might be found responsible in the college proceeding before the criminal proceedings reach their conclusion and the criminal charges may result in finding that the allegation was unfounded. So then you have an institution who's disciplined a student because the student was unable to defend themselves and you've got that same student being essentially found to, to not have violated the law by a criminal proceeding. Is that a good result? Is that a result that we can avoid by some other mechanism? One of the other things I mentioned that the Dear Colleague letter did <clears throat> was require the imposition of a preponderance of evidence standard. Do you guys know the preponderance of evidence standard? Audience participation? More likely than not, right? That's what we say. I, ha I, have, this, 
I have this client, he's, he's an absolute delight, former military guy. He says, and, and I mean, this is common language, 50% plus a feather. Every time I talk to him, we talk about 50% plus a feather. And, and the concept is, right, thinking about the scales of justice, if they are perfectly balanced, but then a feather lands on one side, that tips the balance. That's preponderance of evidence. And he is always talking to me about the feather. You know, does this fact, is that the feather? Is that fact, is that the feather? You know, the student said he was banging his head on the bathroom wall, so I went in the bathroom and I did that, and it didn't make a mark. Is that the feather? Um, the conversations I have with him. Um, so 50% plus a feather, is that the right legal standard to apply? Is that standard too high? Is it too low? Is it fair to expel a student if only the preponderance is met? Is it fair to expel a student based on a feather? Think about the significant impact on the student. It's possible that a college expulsion proceeding might actually have more impact than what they might experience in a criminal proceeding. Right? Criminal proceeding, you can plead down, maybe you plead down to some low-level assault charge, you get probation, nine months later, you're done. You get expelled from your college, you, that expulsion's reported on your transcript, other institutions aren't interested in accepting you as a student, your life goes off track, you can't complete your degree. That's a big impact. Is, is that impact something that we need to weigh in choosing whether we apply the preponderance of the evidence standard. A criminal proceeding, right, you all know this, you watch Law and Order, beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Beyond a reasonable doubt. So when we say, when lawyers talk about, you know, 50% plus a feather and we talk about beyond a reasonable doubt, if you ask lawyers what's beyond a reasonable doubt in percentages, they'll say somewhere above 90. Some of them will say 95, 98, 99. But it's clearly a really, really much higher percentage. Um, so there are consequences of all of those choices and consequences that affect people in ways that are expected that we can predict and consequences that affect people in ways that are unexpected that we can't predict. And that's why these issues are challenging and nuanced and that's why I have as many gray hairs as my mother used to like to point out to me that I had. There was one more, um, well, really two, major shifts in the Title IX world, and I'll, I'll go through these more quickly so we can move on from Title IX. Um, in November of 2017, we were all told there's gonna be a new rulemaking, there'll be a public comment period, and then we'll have new regulations. What, and, and in fact, there were never any Title IX regulations. We had all this informal guidance, multiple letters over the years that try to, try to tell institutions what to do, and then there were questions about those. Um, we were finally gonna get regulations, so the lawyers rejoiced, right? We are finally gonna have a set of black and white rules that will help us navigate these really tough issues. Um, the public comment period lasted only several months, I think four, three to four. 124,000 public comments were submitted. If that doesn't tell you that these issues are nuanced and, nuanced and challenging and important and affect people IRL, IRL, right, um, I don't know what else could. I mean, that suggests to me at least that these issues are really difficult to grapple with and that people have a lot of divergent views on them. So after being told in 2017 that, new, that regulations were coming, they were finally announced on May 6, 2020. How many words are in Title IX? You guys are a great audience. When the, when the rulemaking came out, we got 2,007 pages of explanation and 26 pages of regulations that went into effect in August, three months. And this was 2020. So there was this other little thing going on in the spring of 2020, a global pandemic. <laughs> um, again, every gray hair is earned, right? <laughs> we had three months to di read, digest, help our clients make policy decisions, draft policies, and get them adopted through shared governance, board meetings that weren't scheduled because the last meeting was in May and the next one's not till September, <laughs> right? Um, just, just challenging times. 
So I just hearken back to when you read the newspaper accounts of a Title IX situation, and, and I'm sorry, here's just a little bit of bias. When you read the ones that are critical of colleges and universities, please just put a little bit of that into context, right? It may not be as simple, in fact, it likely is not as simple as it may appear in a newspaper article. And, and again, I, I want to say that, you know, I, I am sincerely an advocate for students as much as I am for my clients. I mean, students are my clients, <laughs> right? I mean, they, they are so much a part of the institution. And, and, I, and I don't mean to suggest that these issues don't impact people in a really important way. And I also don't mean to imply that institutions don't make mistakes. We do. I mean, we're, you know, institutions are run by human beings who are doing the best they can and do not always get it right. But I ask for just a little bit of charity to think about the difficult pressures um, that happen in any of these situations. <clears throat> and then I'll just say the, the very most recent phase of development in this area of the law um, began just in June of 2022. Um, this time we only got 701 pages of notice of more Title IX regulations and changes. And these involve things like sex stereotypes, sex characteristics, pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, right? So, I mean, man, we've been through a lot of really challenging and nuanced issues, and the road ahead is not any easier. It's, it's just as hard. Um, just a couple of other things, um, because Title IX is just such a meaty source <laughs> of controversy. Um, the, the regulations that came out in 2020, they, requi they required that parties have the right to choose an advisor, including lawyers. They required live hearings and cross-examination, live cross-examination for colleges and university proceedings. And again, think about the impacts of those things. Um, certain groups would say to you, lawyers, Live hearings and cross-examination cross will only cause students who experience sexual harassment and sexual misconduct to be unwilling to report. They aren't going to want to come forward. If they wanted to experience that, they would go to the police, right? Some groups would say that to you. So you're going to actually do less <laughs> to address sexual harassment and sexual misconduct than you would have done under other rules. Some people would make that position. Other people would say, are you kidding? If you're going to expel a student, if you're going to impose discipline, these things are vital to a fair process. Think about the impact where it can be so significant. Of course we need lawyers, of course we need advocates, of course we need a real hearing where people can actually confront the evidence against them. But what do you do if one student has a lawyer but the other one can't afford one? Some other commentators on Title IX who will share your opi their opinions that I will not share. Um, also ask questions about the educational mission versus an adequate response, right? Are these requirements that we now have, are they asking institutions to act like mini criminal courts? And is that the right role for an institution to be playing? And is that a necessary role in order to protect students from unlawful harassment on campuses? Should colleges not be in the business of doing what criminal proceedings were designed to do? Or is this issue so important and so prevalent in a campus climate that we have to require this? Otherwise, some students will feel restricted, prohibited from really engaging in the educational programs or services. Right? Those are the kinds of questions. And as I said, my goal is to not <laughs> share my opinions on any of these questions. As I said, the only personal opinions I want to share with you is that these issues are important, nuanced, and complex. These are just really tough issues with valid arguments on both sides, and sometimes valid arguments on many, many sides, not just two. So I've like told you, like, bad news, bad news, bad news, bad news. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? Well, what I hope I do at least more often than not, is recognize this reality and engage in a respectful discourse, actively look for areas of agreement, and attempt to gain consensus around a reasonable path forward. I don't have any answers. Sometimes I say to my clients, who I've known for a long time, that when I graduated from law school, they gave me a degree, but they didn't give me a magic wand. I can't answer 
all these questions. I don't think anybody can, but, but maybe that's okay. I mean, maybe what that tells us is there needs to be more dialogue, that there needs to be more thought, that there needs to be more energy from the really smart people out there to think through these issues. Mondays and Fridays in my office are the hardest days. <laughs> Because Mondays, I get all the phone calls about the things that happened over the weekend. And Fridays, I get all the phone calls that people didn't get to all week long that now they suddenly need answers to before the next weekend. And I, and I am wildly unsuccessful, especially on Mondays and Fridays. But I try really hard to think about what Lincoln said about letting our hearts be touched by our better, better angels and try to react without the emotion and try to react, thinking about the Benedictine hallmarks that are part of the education that I experienced here at St. Vincent. Okay, are we, like, we're Title ix out, right? <laughs> All right, so I don't wanna disregard the fact that there are other really, really important student rights issues, and, and I mean, there are dozens we could talk about, but let, let me just touch, and I mean briefly, I promise you briefly, on just a couple other areas, right? So non-discrimination based on race and national origin, those are also very nuanced, challenging issues. Right now, the Harvard admissions case is pending, right? And in that case, Harvard has asserted to the Supreme Court um, that it uses race among many factors it considers for admitting students, because doing so is core to its goal of diversifying its student body and enriching the educational experience of its students. That's, that's the allegation. So, I mean, we do, have a, we do have a federal law, Title VI, that essentially says, you, you, and, and it's not 37 words, by the way, it's bigger. Um, it says that race discrimination is violation of federal law. Should that federal law prohibit what Harvard is doing, considering race and its admissions? I mean, an easy answer is to, is to say, well, yeah, because look at the federal law, that's what it says. You can't discriminate based on race. Um, no person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, national origin, be excluded from participation in, be, not, be, not, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance, right? That's the law. So it's easy to look at that and say, yeah, no, Harvard, you're not allowed. Um, but in fact, when Title IX was adopted, President Kennedy spoke about it, and he said, simple justice requires that public funds to which all taxpayers of all races contribute not be spent in any fashion which encourages, entrenches, subsidizes, or results in racial discrimination. So is what Harvard doing entrenching racial discrimination, or is it trying to undo the effects of racial discrimination? I'm not on the Supreme Court. I don't know the answer to that one. I guess we'll all find out. Interesting. Interestingly, institutions that participate in federal student aid programs are, except in very, very limited circumstances, prohibited from awarding scholarships based on race, national origin, and sex. I get, I get these calls a lot um, about scholarship restrictions. So, you know, an institution will call me up re recently, within the last several months. The faculty at this institution wanted to create a race preference scholarship because they wanted to try to diversify their student body because they thought it was important. But they, they're not allowed. So I have to say no to that, right? Um, a donor wants to create a scholarship in a nursing area to encourage men to go into nursing, right, where they're underrepresented. Uh, underrepresented. Well, well, they can do that but if they do that, then the college can't administer it. They're gonna to have to administer it themselves, take applications, decide who deserves the scholarship, award the scholarship, et cetera, right? Women underrepresented in physics, I've had that question. Um, students of color underrepresented at a specific college. And again, you know, are those the right choices to be made? I'm not sure the answers are all that clear. Um, so I think what we have to do is we have to struggle through them, right? And we have to do it not in the way we do social media. We have to do it, right? I mean, you've all had this experience, right? Where you went on Facebook and you read the comments and somebody said, wow, this Facebook comment completely changed my view. I am so glad for this thoughtful, engaged, respectful discourse, <laughs> right? I mean, that's your experience. No. Um, 
right? We have to do it in a way that we don't do it on social media. We have to do it in a way that we don't do it when we want to sell a lot of newspapers with a splashy headline, right? Like that, that I think, maybe that's the other opinion I'll share with you tonight. I think that piece I feel pretty confident is an opinion I can share with you. Um, and then one, one last area, and, and, and not less important, but perhaps maybe just a little less heavy, <laughs> is, um, is disability rights discrimination. So Title III of the ADA prohibits public accommodations, and it specifically says colleges and universities are public accommodations from discriminating against persons with disabilities. If you're a public accommodation, you have to make reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. These are, these are tough issues. <laughs> that land on my desk. Sometimes they, they're slightly funny too, but they're tough issues. And a recent one that has come up just for the, you know, the sixth time probably over the years, a student has a seizure disorder. It can be impacted by stress. And the student requests that all faculty be trained to administer the student's seizure medication in the event of an emergency. Is that a reasonable accommodation? I mean, sitting here right now, you may have an answer to that question in your mind. Let me ask you this question. What if it's oral medication? Should we ask our faculty members to place oral medication in the mouth of someone in an act of seizure? What if it's an injection? What if it's medication that's administered rectally? There are many reported cases on that exact issue. I don't know the answers to those questions, but I, I think they're difficult questions and I think they're worth wrestling with. What's reasonable and what's not? Um, what if a professor takes a student, takes a group of students on a field trip in a van and one student has a service a, a dog and another student has a severe pet allergy? What do we do? Do we tell one student to drive? Which student do we tell to drive, right? I mean, like I said, these are a little bit lighter than sexual misconduct, but still really important issues, still have really important effects still affect people in real life? Um, what if a student has a 110 pound Bernese mountain dog as their emotional support animal and they want to live with a roommate like other students do, but the available dormitory spaces are too small to accommodate such a large animal and two students? What do you do? What do you do if that same student missed the deadline to apply for housing accommodations? I mean, maybe we should just say no, right? They missed the deadline. Well, what if they missed it because they have ADHD and they struggled with completing the many detailed tasks that are associated with new student onboarding, right? So, gr right, gray hairs, <laughs> gray hairs. Um, these issues of student civil rights often evoke a really strong emotional reaction. They should. They should. They're, they're involving fundamental rights and weighty issues that have significant impacts on people. But I think where we're not quite doing a job as society, we're not, we're not, quite, we're not hitting this boat, right? We're missing this boat. As a society, I think we have to think more about distinguishing those emotional reactions from informed convictions. I'm not sure we see a lot of that happening right now. And I fear that a lot of opportunities for respectful discourse that could lead to understanding and recognition of areas of mutual agreement on these important and complex issues, they're just being missed because of the emotional noise. Uh, you know, the outrage machine, I've heard it called, but it's, it's the emotional noise. And it's not on one side of the issue or the other side of the issue, it's on all sides of the issue. So, let me encourage you. As I said at the beginning, I truly believe that as members of the St. Vincent community, we are in fact uniquely qualified to engage with these challenging issues. I think about the student that I was when I came from my little tiny, tiny small town and my very limited experiences, a 17 year old landed on this campus. And honestly, I think about the person that I was just one year later, having been here, having been under the mentorship of this amazing faculty having been in a situation where I met students from so many different backgrounds, 
Alaska and Texas, I never knew anyone from Alaska or Texas, let alone students of a different race, students of a different religion, right? That, I mean, it just was my limited experience. And then to think about the person that I was when I graduated four years later, I am so grateful to this institution, right? And, and I'm not saying I was a bad person as a 17 year old, but I'm just so grateful that I don't have to still be the person I was as a 17 year old student. And so much of that due to this, due to this institution. Okay, so why do I think we're uniquely qualified? Because of the hallmarks of a Benedictine education. I think that they can serve as a practical roadmap, a real roadmap that we can all use for talking about these issues, even when they're emotionally charged context. So let me just talk about five of, five of the 10, right? The first two, grounded in love, a Benedictine, a hallmark of a Benedictine education is that it is grounded in love, and another one is that it is attentive. And this stuff is now published right on the St. Vincent website, so you should all go read it tonight, or maybe tomorrow, because you're all going out for beers after this tonight. Grounded in love, God's love reaches beyond all differences and calls upon us to support each other in a rigorous and disciplined search for knowledge. Right? If we could hold that in our minds as we deal with some of these complex issues, I think we end up in a much better place. Attentive. To cultivate a habit of listening required to see and hear each person to know better the richness, fullness, and interconnected nature of life. If we could approach these conversations from a starting place that is loving and supportive, think about the conversations we could be having about these hard issues. Try not to come to them itching for a fight like I do on Mondays and Fridays. <laughs> Actually listen to the other person's views with an open and curious mind. Wow, think about what might happen then. And one of the things I'm struggling with, and I've talked to Father Paul about this recently, is that I feel like sometimes it's easy to just assume that the other person's views are based in an ill motive or are simply uninformed because they're different from yours. And I feel like that's just so unfair. And I don't think we should do that to each other in society. Not, not when we're talking about important issues. I mean, if we're talking about Ravens fans and Steelers fans, okay, Kate. <laughs> Not on these important issues, right? Um, I learned a technique recently, it was just this summer. Do you guys know the last letter of the last word listening technique? Do you know this? Yeah, I was at this conference and a bunch of people already knew it, but the speaker, a guy named Steve Hughes, and by the way, I, I mean, I just heard him speak. He's a great speaker, you should look him up. Um, he talked to us about having a conversation that is difficult and forcing yourself to start your response with the last letter of the last word of the person who spoke before you, right? I, I need practical advice. Like on Mondays and Fridays when my world is kind of chaotic, and I'm maybe not in the best mood, and I may be frustrated, and I maybe need more coffee. The last letter of the last word technique re really works. It stops you from interrupting people. It forces you to actually listen to the very end of what they're saying before you start your response. I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a little cheesy, but you know, if you're grasping for straws in a really rough day, I think it's a technique that works. All right, let me get back to the hallmarks, right? Um, generous and hospitable. Generous, a Benedictine education, uh, whether in classroom or through service, seeks to challenge closely held assumptions and encourage giving of self for the greater good. Hospitable, welcoming new ideas, fresh perspectives and experiences, right? Avoiding the echo chamber of ideas. I mean, we didn't used to have this experience, right? There were only five national networks. <laughs> there was no TikTok and Twitter. And so we all had the same sort of context, but we don't, we don't have that anymore. Um, or only talking to people about issues that you agree on, not talking about issues where you don't agree, right? That's another, that's another place where I feel like we've missed opportunities. Um, when was the last time you heard or read someone say, that's a new perspective about the issue that I hadn't considered before? Like, we don't say that enough to each other. Or your experience as a person of color, as a person with a disability, as a, as, a, as a woman, has made me realize something that I didn't understand before, right? 
Your idea about promoting a diverse campus has caused me to change my mind about, right? I mean, I think those are the conversations that we can be having and that we as St. Vincent can be leaders in having, right? Leaders here, leaders in your workplaces, leaders in your friend groups, leaders in your churches. I think we can have a really, really strong impact. So I really dislike the term flip-flopper. It's not used as much now, but you would always hear flip-flopper. Oh my gosh, she's a flip-flopper. That politician is a flip-flopper. There was a, so I work in Harrisburg, right? There was a guy who would dress up in a giant flip-flop costume and, and, and you know, protest on the, on the stairs of the Capitol. And I just, I just, I don't like that. It, v, it devalues changing one's mind when a well-reasoned decision to change an opinion based in a new perspective, based on new information or change circumstances, like that's a good thing. And yes, you can be a flip-flopper who is not principled, right, about changing your views. And that, that flip-flopping, I think, is, is, is not something that I'm promoting. But I think it's easy to throw the word flip-flop at people just because they have changed their view, but they may have changed it for a really principled reason, right? So I just flip-flopper, don't, I also don't wear flip-flop, I'm just kidding. The last Benedictine hallmark um, is, is the one that I would point out to you tonight is, is communal, right? The principle around understanding ourselves better through our relationships, especially those relationships that challenge us to overcome preconceptions and surrender bias, right? I think we can live this by example and we can lead in this by example. So I have two final thoughts for you. Oh, and I should have said at the beginning, we're going to do a Q&A. So, and where's Mr. Schulte? Oh, there he is. I told him he had to ask me a softball question. So we'll see if he, he didn't agree to that, but I'm hoping now that I've put him on the spot in front of the whole room, he'll, he'll do that. <clears throat> Just two final thoughts for you. One is, I don't want you to leave here tonight and think that I'm advocating that people have no real strong convictions or that people should not be honest about the convictions they have, right? Like, I, I hope that's not the message that you take away. Rather, I think that we should want our convictions to be informed and that we should not avoid the discussions that may make us think more deeply about our convictions and maybe, maybe question them for a principled reason, right? And then the very last thought for you is just to go back to St. Vincent's motto, which I bet a bunch of you realized was referenced in the title of this talk, right? Guarding truth and justice in a, in a developing landscape, right? What does St. Vincent's motto tell us, tells us guards truth and justice? It's, it's knowledge, right? Knowledge is the guardian of truth and justice. So I leave it at that to say, these issues are great. They're exciting and they're tough. And you and we can really make an impact in the way that we talk about them to each other, to our societies, to our churches, to our friends. Um, I'm excited about that. I hope you're excited about that. Again, it's been my absolute pleasure to be with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, please stick around if you want for Q&A. Thanks. Yes, many people have that view. affirmative defense is going to go. Did everyone hear that? Did everyone hear the question? Yeah, so I'll summarize it, Rich, and then you can tell me when I get it wrong. Um, so Rich was saying, you know, you've got the Harvard case, and there are a lot of people out there who have said, you know, the court that we have is likely to say, uh, eliminate affirmative action. And the question was, do I think that could lead to undermining, for example, Title IX, because that is, isn't that, you know, sort of affirmative action based on sex? Fair summary? 
Yes. Yes. Um, and so Rich is following up and saying, getting into the areas in those new, those new 701 pages that I mentioned, that, that you know, get into areas like sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. Um, I will say this, there are a lot of people who are really concerned about that. Um, there are Supreme Court scholars. There's a really great guy from, I think he's from Stanford. Richard, the name is failing me. Um, Anyway, there are a lot of Supreme Court scholars that have that concern. Um, that they, you know, they question like, if we don't draw the line here, we slide down, we slide down a slippery slope. Um, I mean, if you think about it from a purely legal analysis perspective, that makes sense to me. Do I think that will actually happen? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Is it something to be concerned about? Is it something that we should be talking to each other about? Probably. Any other questions? Well, I have lots of questions. <laughs> I don't know which one to pick. Okay. Um, well, I guess the first question was, I want to go back to the toxic, is that the word? Hostile, hostile, hostile educational hostile environment. environment, yep. Mm -hmm. Does the hostile environment have to be created because of sexual harassment? Or can a hostile environment be created that's not based Yes. That's the first question. Okay, so let me answer that one because I'll forget it. I, I, you know, one softball at a time. <laughs> so the question was, is the hostile educational environment concept, does that apply only if you have a situation harassment arising out of sex, or does it apply otherwise? Can there be a hostile environment other ways? So I, so I would say the law has recognized the hostile educational environment in Title IX, which is sexual harassment. It has also recognized that same theory in Title VII, actually before, in title, before it came up in Title VII before Title IX. So Title VII is uh, racial, national origin, essentially, discrimination. So yes, you can have a hostile, under the law, you can have a hostile environment based on race, national origin, or sex. Do I, go ahead. Um, not exactly. No, the standard of proof, right? Yeah, you're asking does the preponderance of evidence apply to that determination of, it doesn't. That's sort of a separate issue. So preponderance of evidence is the, uh, the standard of proof that colleges have to apply when they're disciplining a student. The hostile educational environment is the standard that the courts apply when they look at the institution and say, did you do the right thing? Did you do enough to stop this environment that you know is being proved right in a in a court case. So they are they are slightly different. So I'm going to come back to you if you have more questions. But I'm going to let somebody else. I saw another hand. Yes, sir. Um, great question. So I'll sort of summarize it again just for people who couldn't hear. So, the, so the, this commenter was saying, you know, places of higher education where you would think civil discourse, respectful discourse would be, you know, part of the core culture, right? A common experience. We read in the newspaper that that's not necessarily happening. And the question was, is that my experience? And honestly, my experience is, is not. <coughs> And, and I'm, I may be lucky, <laughs> or it may be that certain headlines sell more newspapers than others. Um, I have seen a lot of institutions, and, I, and I, <clears throat> I belong to a group of lawyers, National College and University Attorneys Association, and just an amazing group of people <coughs> with various political viewpoints, by the way, um, who have tried really, really hard to wrestle with these issues and have tried to come up with ways of protecting that civil discourse. So yeah, we can have a controversial speaker on our campus if students invite that speaker. 
Oh, I'm good, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I had a, I mean, I was sick last week, so I just have a little tickle, so I, I apologize for coughing. Um, I have seen institutions working really hard to do the opposite, right? So if students invite a controversial speaker to our campus, we're not gonna say no to that person, and we're not gonna let student protests interrupt that person because that's not a respectful dialogue, but are we gonna look for someone to present the other viewpoint? So it's balanced, right? Because isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're not supposed to present one side. We're supposed to educate people, make them critical thinkers. That's what my experience has been in higher ed. I will tell you this, on the University of Chicago has, and I think it's still published publicly, a really great statement on free speech on campuses. And it is, it is acknowledging those things. It is acknowledging that uncomfortable conversations should not be prohibited. In fact, students need to experience some uncomfortable conversations, but there need to be some structures around that because you can't let those uncomfortable conversations turn into an environment where people don't feel welcome, right? That's not, that's not what we want either. So I, I really appreciate that question because I don't think what you see in the papers is what's happening on a lot of, on a lot of college campuses. Any other questions? What, yeah, one, yeah. I just want to uh, tell a brief anecdote. Sure. In 1967, Bill <laughs> Rosenthal went to Chuck Minoli and as he was planning a week's study on communism and asked Chuck whether it was appropriate to have Herbert Africker, who was the Secretary General of the Communist Party of the United States, as a speaker on St. Vincent's campus. And I believe that Chuck Minoli was one of the people who said yes. So, the, so the, the point of that and the anecdote is having a controversial speaker and then building around it an, an environment where there can be that respectful discourse, <clears throat> sharing of various views, that impacted, that had a real impact. Again, I, you know, it's interesting because free speech really isn't, weirdly, sorry, we're a private institution. <laughs> St. Vincent is, my clients mostly are, right? There, there, there really isn't a, there really isn't a legal free speech obligation for an institution like this. But most institutions, and by the way, the accrediting agencies expect, um, that there will be a reflection of free speech principles on campus, right? That there will be a real commitment to that. And again, I really think, I mean, it's the fight fire with fire theory, right? I mean, I'm a simple thinker when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes down to it, I think, you know, if you're going to have, if you're going to have a speaker on a controversial topic, don't we want to have the other side as well, right? That, that's what I would say. And I would say to students, you know, respectfully protesting, respectfully questioning, respectfully challenging. And by the way, I think we saw some of that happen with St. Vincent students. I think that's great. And that should be part of the dialogue. Right? But heckling, shouting down a speaker from the back of the room so that speaker can't be heard, I think that's the wrong, the wrong choice. And shoot, I just violated my rule of not sharing my personal opinions. All right. It's late. It's 20 after 8. I want to say again, I mean, just thank you. You guys have been a great audience. Um, this has just been such an absolute pleasure to me. I, I hate the fact that I have to drive back to go to work tomorrow, but thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Attorney Colonna. Excellent. I use the word excellent because it begins with an E. <laughs> and she finished her statements by saying here, so I chose the word excellent that began with an E. So excellent. 
um, and thank you for your insights um, and your wisdom. I can tell you that every college president in the United States and abroad, but especially in these United States, is well aware of the issues that Kim presented tonight. And each of us are grateful for Kim and her colleagues who bring such insight and clarity and understanding and compassion uh, for um, the presidents and all of us who lead and all of us faculty who are on these campuses working with these students, helping them to grow and to learn and become adults. Um, and these issues are important. And the insights that she brought to this group tonight are critically important, not just for our students, but for each of us and for our country as we move forward. So thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for being here. And may the angels guide you on your drive uh, back. Um, and so let us now pray to conclude. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you again. God bless Chuck and Anita. Thank you for being here.